Σω. Μισό λεπτό, μισό λεπτό. Τώρα είμαστε έτοιμοι. Οκ, welcome to all. May I give the floor first to Mr. Javier from the European Economic and Social Committee that hosts our event. Please, Mr. Javier. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to welcome all the participants on behalf of the European Economic and Social Committee. Uh, as you probably are aware, uh, the European Economic and Social Committee is the voice of organized civil society in Europe uh, with an advisory role among all the institutions in the European Union. We have 329 members from different nationalities and we are divided in, in three groups. The groups of employers, group one, group of uh, workers, group two, and uh, the group of, uh, it's called Diversity Europe in group three. I'm part of uh, group three. I work uh, uh, since already 25 years ago in the passionate world of the fishing industry. I'm uh, the Secretary General of the Spanish Fishing Confederation, the President, uh, the Chair of uh, Europesh, which is the European organization defending the interests of uh, fishing companies and uh, the president the chair of uh, ICFA the international coalition of fisheries organizations which is the organizations the organization which give us the voice in uh, in international organizations like united nations fao etc and that's why i'm so interested in, in also in in this issue that we are dealing here today um, and, and we have a section called NAT, which is, uh, covers agriculture, rural development and environment. This is the title, but also covers issues like, like fisheries and, and blue economy. Uh, in, in, the, in the committee, we have been working and dealing with the blue economy uh, for, for several years, and we have several opinions on, on that. In, in this work, the committee has stressed the importance of involving local, public and private uh, sector stakeholders, as well as social partners and civil society organizations within their respective areas of activity, including transport safety and security, fisheries, tourism and energy, social cohesion and environmental sustainability. We have, as I said, several, uh, several uh, reports on, on this. So, uh, this this uh, this conference is is, in, is I think it's it's an important issue also for the committee and that's why I'm I'm very glad to be here uh, today and uh, and uh, and to welcome you. Uh, of course, to focus on on Iceland islands it's is the main issue here today. There are so many more than 250 island regions in the European Union, and you are a very important part of Europe. Also, sometimes it looks that you are so far that uh, nobody is, or not so many people is paying so much attention on your, on your need. That's why I think that uh, forums like this are very important. So I wish you the best of uh, success in this event and uh, I, will, I will follow it uh, to learn more about it and if possible to take the main messages to the committee for our future uh, report on, on, on Blue Economy. Thank you very much and I hope it's very successful. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Javier Garat Perez. Uh, I mean, really, the uh, European Economic and Social Committee is always supporting uh, Insular and all our events, uh, and ho uh, hopefully in the future we will have also your support. Now, the floor to uh, the Vice Rector, Mr. Uh, Nicolas Vulgaris. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be among you today. Uh, on behalf of our Rector, Professor Dimopoulos, I would like to welcome everyone to this workshop and wish you success uh, in the uh, proceedings that will follow, which address a very interesting issue, not only for Greece, but also for the other European countries, especially for those with a strong insularity character. The National Capodistrian University of Athens has instituted 14 centers of excellence, among which perhaps the most active at the moment 
is the center of excellence of blue growth, shipping and maritime environment in solarity. On behalf of which, I will gladly co-sign the memorandum of understanding between the center of excellence, blue growth, shipping, maritime, marine environment and insularity, and the network of insular chambers of commerce and industry of the European Union. Moreover, we plan to use the press office of NKUA, of the National Kabbalistic University of Athens, to promote to the academic community the conclusion of this workshop, since within the aims of all these centers of excellence uh, we created about two years ago is the effort to uh, strengthen uh, the synergies between different uh, uh, fields of science as well as the industry. So uh, thank you very much for attending. I wish you all uh, a very successful meeting and hope that we will meet again very soon uh, with uh, several more targeted actions. And physical presence. <laughs> of course. Thank you, Vice Rector of Bulgaris, for uh, this uh, very interesting introduction and uh, for your help to organize this event. And now I give I mean, the floor to our President, Mr. Joseph Borch from Gojo, chamber. George, uh, the president needs to be unmuted. Please unmute, unmute yourself, Joseph. Okay, all right, that's that's fine. It yes. is a pleasure for me to welcome you as president of Insular on this workshop on maritime spatial planning as a tool to boost and support blue entrepreneurship in islands. Apart from thanking George Asonitis, who has introduced me, and Irene Michaelis on behalf of Insular, I would like also to thank our partners on this event, the European Economic and Social Committee and the Center of Excellence on Blue Growth Shipping Maritime Environment Insularity of the National and Kapodistrian University of Athens. We look forward in the next few minutes to sign the memorandum of understanding between Insular and the University. As islands, we have a very special interest in the sea. We are surrounded by the sea, which at times is connected to isolation. However, it is my hope that this webinar will not show our limitations, but rather our strengths. We speak many a times of blue growth, that is, the economic development that is linked to the sea. However, this obviously does not come on its own. It is the result of careful planning, and this is where maritime spatial planning comes in. We cannot speak of blue growth, and with the opportunities linked to the sea, if we do not plan ahead of what we require of our coastal regions. This becomes all the more important when one considers that according to the existing directive, EU countries should have had to hand their maritime special plans in place by March of this year. A lot of activities on islands are obviously linked to maritime activity, tourism, for example. And unfortunately, and this has been shown by the COVID-19 pandemic, we are, our islands are overexposed to tourism. However, this is not the only activity. There are multiple uses, including, for example, desalination plants, which can provide essential water to our islands, which most often need to import water from the mainland. There are also other activities linked to the sea, including commercial and artisanal fishing activity. However, this also points to another issue. Yesterday, I was participating at the Conference of Peripheral Maritime Regions, the CPMR General Assembly. A declaration was discussed in which climate neutrality featured as one of the most important aspects. 
the declaration highlighted the Thailands are, I quote, among those territories that are most vulnerable to the effects of global warming, unquote. This will have significant impact on our coastal regions. And as I also highlighted in a number of my past interventions, islands will be the most affected. However, I also believe that islands can achieve carbon neutrality before the mainland, given the required incentives, and show the way forward on how things can be done sustainably, even on the mainland. Consequently, in our analysis on maritime spatial planning, sustainability plays a very crucial part. Thus, when speaking of tourism demands on coastal areas, we must seek that these promote sustainable forms of tourism. The same relates to energy generation. Here, we must focus on clean energy. However, in all this, we must not forget that coastal regions many a times provide the only access points to our islands. To this end, I believe that this is an important aspect that also needs to be taken into consideration. As president of Insular, I wish you all that this webinar will be an interesting forum of discussion. And now I leave the floor to our friend, Mr. Lefterios Kekagioglu, president of the network of the small Greek islands. Thank you. Dear organizers, representative of a European institution, entrepreneurship and science, Friends of University. My name is Ekater Shihalioglu and I'm the president of Hellenic Small Island Network and vice president of European Small Island Federation. Eleven countries participate in our federation. In total, about half a million inhabitants live in the winter around the year on the 1,500 small islands of the Europe. On an annual basis, we have a negative rate, negative sector of abandonment of small islands all over the Europe. What's wrong with that? One thing is certain. If you want the small islands to be sustainable, they must be competitive. The main factor is and should be the entrepreneurship. The island is the place where you live, work on the island, invest your money and hope for a better tomorrow. This effort of yours is not outside our goals. For this reason, we thank you for our common demands and I hope this situation will be reversed. I wish you good success in your events today and we remain of the same goal. Good success to everyone and thank you for invitation. I will stay to listen to all of you and I hope next meeting we will meet up closer. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Lefteris. You are always a perennial friend of Insular. We have collaborated a lot of times and we will collaborate in the future, I think. Now the floor, least but not last, as they say, to our friend Gianni, Gianni Chianetta, who is the president, the founder of the Green and the Islands organization, working really not only Europe, on European level, but also on global level. Johnny, the floor is yours. Thank you, George, uh, and uh, thank you, uh, Joe. Uh, I'd like to thank a lot, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank a lot, uh, Insular, for the invitation, for the great collaboration that we have on all our programs. Going to the point of the topic today, I think um, islands um, uh, has, um, need to use the sea, which is a great opportunity for the decarbonization. Um, to decarbonize an island, we need an energy mix, and the, the, the space available is very little in many islands, and the sea represents a great opportunity for the green power generation. Uh, of course, uh, offshore uh, projects on wind and solar 
represent an opportunity uh, also because they have uh, a, a better social acceptance. Uh, islands, uh, of course, a big project, for instance, if I think about uh, uh, large uh, um, uh, wind offshore uh, project um, are strategic for uh, uh, important countries, for, for all countries, and islands represent an opportunity to test, uh, um, to, the, to adjust uh, uh, auctions, permitting, and uh, on also business models. And there are a lot of opportunities also of uh, cross-border projects um, like uh, um, with uh, uh, special funds from the European Commission, like, like the CEF funds, uh, CA, CEF funding, which uh, fund uh, projects which are, anyway, uh, of common interest. Uh, but the, the, there are problems uh, because uh, uh, islands uh, um, uh, have not a, a proper involvement in uh, the decision on uh, on uh, on the uh, maritime spatial plans from the central government, so it's very important to involve the islands um, in the decisions from the central government. The permitting process is very low, uh, and there are too many uh, bodies involved or involved, and uh, um, many islands, uh, uh, many governments, as not presented as were supposed to do by March uh, uh, to the European Commission, uh, the uh, maritime spatial planning uh, that are not available. Um, so we in, in Green the Islands we have uh, we think our observatory we have a, a task force uh, on a floating offshore wind together with uh, uh, Wind Europe, which is the industry association of, of European industry association of uh, the wind sector, for instance, and uh, we have developed some recommendations um, uh, because uh, um, uh, we is important to have uh, uh, local competences to approve project. Uh, as I said before, to simplify the number of administration involved, uh, information are often not uh, available, and uh, we need clarity on uh, um, on uh, the envelope permitted, uh, for instance, distance from uh, shore um, and so on. Um, we, of course, uh, uh, maritime spatial planning is. Uh, very complex uh, uh, topic, and um, but there are a lot of projects in the pipelines, and we cannot wait that uh, all the framework is set up before starting a first pioneer project, because the first pioneer project will open the floor to adjust the big picture, the big uh, framework. And uh, um, it is very important that uh, um, local communities, um, a, a local stakeholders like a fishing industry is involved in, uh, in, in this kind of planning. And there are a lot of examples from all the world, uh, from uh, South Korea, from Scotland, where uh, this community has been involved since the beginning. There is uh, the cost of these technologies is going down, for instance, from the floating of shore wind, uh, we are planning to have uh, between 40 and 60 euro per megawatt hour by 2030. And uh, um, the, these technologies will contribute for high qualified jobs. Um, I, in, in our task force, uh, I see here many faces like uh, Mr. Lexaxis. Uh, uh, there are some islands uh, like uh, Greece, uh, like Crete, uh, Sicily, Canary Islands, and, uh, and Malta that are uh, um, uh, let's, uh, a case studies. And, uh, but we invite all islands to attend uh, um, our uh, workshops uh, and task forces because we want really to connect the industry with uh, the government and with the local community, which is very important. We are going to talk about uh, authorization process, uh, about um, uh, auctions, uh, remuneration schemes, which is which are very important. So thank you very much. These are my inputs for our uh, uh, experience, and um, uh, I'm very pleased to listen to the rest of uh, the, the debate the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Gianni. Uh, uh, as you see, Mr. Uh, Javier Garat, I mean, uh, there are different organizations uh, working, I mean, on, on, on the same, in the same uh, subject as you uh, discuss in the uh, committee. 
So as you are, I mean, a consultative body to the uh, decisive uh, bodies, we are, let's say, in some way, a consult consultative bodies to you. So it's an occasion, really, I mean, uh, this one and next, maybe, to organize, I mean, uh, webinars like that, uh, or physical presence. We did it, I mean, uh, 10, 10 years now in Brussels. And we plan to, I mean, uh, repeat uh, this kind of webinars. So uh, most of the uh, speakers have already entered the heart of the subject matter. Uh, but before giving the floor to uh, the second panel and Professor Stella Kivelu, just uh, I would like to uh, request uh, President of Insular, Mr. John Bork, and the Vice Rector, Mr. Nicola Vulgaris, to, let's say, sign virtually. I don't know how to do that, but I will ask the manager of the platform to open the, let's say, the, the two uh, videos, let's say, for them, just to see that the, the, the act is signed. Is it possible? Κύριε Μακρόπουλε, είναι εύκολο να ανοίξετε. Ε, ποιος να ανοίξω, πείτε μου. Τους δύο, τον κύριο Βούλγαρη και τον κύριο Μπόρκ. Τζόζεφ Μπόρκ ή Ντάνιελ Μπόρκ. Και το, και, το, και το βίντεο, αν είναι δυνατόν. Τζόζεφ Ντάνιελ Μπόρκ. Τζόρτζ, Τζόζεφ. Οκ. Thank you. So, it's a pleasure to sign. President? Yes, it's also a pleasure to sign on my part on behalf of Isoler. Thank you very much to the university. For a fruitful uh, collaboration. Thank you, thank you. We look forward. Thank you, Vice Thank you. So now I give the floor to uh, Professor Stella Kivelu and the second panel. The second panel, uh, Stella, you are here. Just to tell you that you can, if you have some questions, you can use the chat right uh, in, the, in the right down and uh, I will uh, intervene with que go your questions to panelists. Ανοίγετε τώρα το κύριε Κιβέλου. Κύριε Κιβέλου, ανοίξτε το μικρόφωνο σας. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for being all here this afternoon uh, for this very interesting webinar organized by the network of uh, the Insular Chambers of Commerce and Industry of the European Union, together with the other organizations already mentioned, and assisted, of course, uh, uh, by other uh, uh, organizations and stakeholders like including the European MSP platform uh, that is represented uh, today by both the focal point uh, experts of the North Sea, uh, Mrs. Patricia Ennett and uh, the Eastern Mediterranean uh, myself. Uh, I would like to thank very much the organizers and especially my colleague and uh, friend uh, Dr. George Asonitis for this invitation and uh, I am aware of time so um, uh, let's move on uh, uh, to our first speaker Professor Serafim Poulos uh, who is the coordinator of the Center of Excellence established recently by the University of Athens and congratulations for this initiative uh, dear Serafim the virtual floor is yours Κύριε Πούλο, πρέπει να ανοίξετε το μικρόφωνο σας. Mm. 
Good afternoon <laughs> for me as well. Professor is professor in oceanography and the physical geography of the University of Athens. Okay. Let me share my screen in order to share with you my presentation, which is here. Okay, thank you, thank you okay. for the invitation, thank you for the organizers, and uh, I move on because I have only 10 minutes and I have a, a lot of slides, but I, I, I'll try to be on time. So, okay. uh, ε, έκανα από το δικό μου share και μετά. Δεν έχετε κάνει share. Α, ένα λεπτάκι. Δίπλα από το start video πρέπει να έχει βγει ένα κουμπάκι που να λέει share. Ναι. Εντάξει. Ναι, ναι. Sorry for this small uh, delay. <clears throat> okay, our uh, subject of this webinar is marine spatial planning as a tool to boost and support blue entrepreneurship in islands and especially maybe in, in small islands. A few words I go very quickly for the audience because between the audience are some uh, students and postgraduate students. When we mean blue growth is a long-term strategy to support sustain one second to move this to sustainable growth in the marine and maritime sectors as a whole. Seas and oceans are drivers for the European economy and have great potential for innovation and growth. It is the maritime contribution to achieving the goals of the Europea, of the Europe 2020 strategy for smart, sustainable and inclusive, of course, uh, growth. This, this, in this figure, you can see the, the areas and the sectors that are uh, either established or emerging sectors. And in the following one, we can see the established sectors, which is are the aquaculture, fisheries, fish processing industry, ports, warehouse, shipbuilding and repair, marine extraction of oil and gas, maritime transport, coastal tourism, while in emerging sectors belong the desalinization process and industry, coastal and environmental protection, offshore wind energy, which is very, in very <coughs> active recently, ocean energy in general, blue bioeconomy and blue biotechnology. Now, how to achieve the uh, blue economy growth? We need common skills, shared infrastructure, sustainable use of the sea, environmental protection, together with marine spatial planning, maritime security, and, mar and of course, marine data. The importance of the blue economy, you can see here for MED, which accounts for about 60 million gross value added per year and in terms of employment goes up to 1,800,000 uh, people working in this sector. <laughs> Especially for the Mediterranean, uh, the coastal tourism has the, the, is a big catch for, for, for the economy. Now about the insularity, and <clears throat> I go very quickly, of course, is composed for four characteristics, the small size, especially in, in the quick case, uh, remoteness and isolation, special experiential identity, particular, written, vulnerable, natural and cultural as well environment. Now, what is the situation of European islands within the context of sustainable development? Uh, only the titles um, through the lack of time, efficiency of an area's economy, social justice and equity, the permanent of social cohesion shows that the grade of diffusion of the benefits of economic development in the local society, while we have the environmental conservation, especially for vulnerable ecosystems. Which are the causes which have led to the current problematic with the question of situation? The overall context links the existing situation with the area, the effect, which with its level of attractiveness. Attractiveness goes to enterprise and economic activities and to the population itself. And here we, I have 
gather together all the special issues, but uh, we can see that for companies and together for population, accessibility is the first issue. And then we have for the companies, labor qualifications and cost, services and infrastructure in support of business, initiativeness of, for companies, agglomeration economies, value of land, research and innovation, social capital, while for the population, important things are the employment and career opportunities, access at and quality of public interest services, security, urban dynamism, value of land, housing, cultural identity. And in common again, governance quality, hazards, ITC facilities and use networking services. Now the challenge is for the island is for insular space is to exploit the constantly changing global environment and make use of the characteristics of insular disadvantages rather than disadvantages. This could be achieved through a catalog of things which I don't have the time to go through. But the second one is the concept of sustainability. This means that the constant developing progress, which simultaneously allows the preservation of both the island physiognomy, diversity, and their characteristics in small scale in depth of time. Such a situation can make the island increasingly attractive as places to live and thus encourage a high degree of permanence for the population. Now, we have, uh, we have proposed two actions uh, to the Ministry of uh, Maritime Affairs in Greece, and one has one addresses the blue economy, uh, blue economy platform, and the other one the smart uh, ports. <clears throat> In terms of blue economy platform, we have uh, promotion actions, which is uh, quite a long list uh, here. We have su support actions, which we can, sorry, which we could uh, assist to this, and to, uh, for instance, analysis of business ideas, preparation of business plans, personalized mentoring institutional framework, funding, etc. This is actions and uh, training actions have been elaborated by the Department of, of Economics of the National Capodistria University of Athens and specifically from uh, Dimitris Kenurius, the professor. And some training actions like today, seminars to strengthen business functions, personal skills development, developing tenure main training programs, workshops and conferences. In terms of, 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 small, of smart port design and infrastructure, we have things to do with the application design and development, crisis management and security, regulatory framework, but more information we could provide later if it, if, if it is required. Now, about, now about the marine spatial planning, okay. We have heard what is marine special planning, but I can go to the next slide, which is, is more in brief. Marine special planning is a public process of analyzing and allocating the spatial and temporal distribution of human activities in marine areas to achieve ecological, economic, and social objectives that are usually specified to the political process. Especially, the, the, some of the main characteristics are ecosystem-based, balancing ecological, economic, and social goals and objectives towards sustainable development, integrated across sectors and agencies and among themselves of governance, place or area-based, adaptive, capable of learning from experience, strategic anticipatory, focused on the long term, and participatory. Now, with uh, Eckler and Fanny from 2009 have identified 10 steps to achieve marine space supply planning, which we can see in the uh, yellowish uh, box, which is identifying needs and the, um, establishing authority, obtaining financial support, organizing the process through pre-planning and participation, defining existing conditions, defining future conditions, special management plan, etc., etc. I don't go through because the next one I think is more interesting. Indicative ecological sector subject to marine special planning. And here we have aquaculture areas, we have fishing areas, we have installation and infrastructure for exploitation and attraction of oil, gas, and other energy resources of minerals and aggregates. We have maritime transport routes and traffic flows. We have military training areas, nitrogen species, raw material, scientific research, summary cable, tourism, coastal, underwater culture. Now, we have to decide how to organize all these things. 
and and of course the decision is ours because we have wind wind farms, offshore windmills, we have in the oil industry, we have uh, shipyards, we have pollution, we have uh, clear waters, we have uh, climatic change, we have tourism, we have a lot of a lot of a lot, uh, many activities. Now, <clears throat> if I come and I'm closing my presentation, if I come down to the Greek uh, situation. The Center of Excellence of the University of Athens recognizes the important role of MSP in blue growth, especially in the case of insular and coastal zone economy in Greece, believing that MSP plans should focus in economical growth in parallel with environmental sustainability. Therefore, for the development of any su success MSP plan, the following public administration divisions have to be involved. For instance, for blue growth and blue economy, it's the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Rural Development and Food. For the tourism, it's the Ministry of Tourism, Culture, the Ministry of Culture, and so on. And there is a nice, I think, and interesting slide where we can see that we, for a, a successful MSP and at the same time for integrated coastal zone management, together with blue growth, have all these six ministries to come together and, and, to, and, and to see how can tackle this problem. And to, in order to achieve this, we need as well the input from the regional administration, the scientific knowledge, and the stakeholders. And when I say scientific knowledge, again, I can identify three areas because we have the planners, but we need the, economy, the economists and, of course, the oceanographers to bring in the knowledge about the marine environment. And in, in contrast to the above, the initiative for MSP has been undertaken only by the Ministry of, Envi of Environment and Energy, and according to the law, the recent law in 2018. And there is a more most recent law, uh, 2020, in which the coastal zone has been exempted from MSP plans, which it is uh, unbelievable. Uh, if, if you would like to do a, a, a proper uh, MSP plan, how can exempt the coastal zone the, where it is the integrated coastal zone management? These are, this is my presentation, and of course, I have to thank uh, finishing Mrs. Theodora Paramana and Mrs. Katerina Kardica for her help to, in preparation of this uh, presentation. Thank you very much, and I'm in your disposal for any questions. I would like to thank uh, very much uh, Professor Poulos uh, for this complete, uh, extremely complete uh, presentation. I just note that uh, uh, finally um, the MSP, beyond being a process uh, for allocating the different uh, maritime uses, uh, is also a, has also a strong cultural dimension and is a creative, I would say, social uh, uh, process of building attractive, uh, you said that, attractive identities for the sea, attractive for, for populations, for inhabitants and also for investments uh, to create uh, blue growth and jobs. And uh, also I would say that uh, it was all, all evident from your um, presentation that uh, uh, MSP finally requires both market and public choice mechanisms. And uh, uh, as far as Greece is, uh, uh, is concerned, uh, I liked very much your final uh, uh, comments about the need to be more interministerial, uh, to, uh, to be uh, if you like, uh, transdisciplinary, uh, uh, multidisciplinary, and so on. Uh, you are right. Um, I thank you again, uh, uh, once again, and uh, I thank would like now to give the floor to Mr. Daniel Borg, uh, the Chief Executive Officer of Gozo Business uh, Chamber, to take us to Malta and Gozo. <laughs> and uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much. I will be now sharing my presentation.
you so thank you very much for for the invite for the invitation extended by Zuler to participate in such a distinguished panel and I'm really honored the subject that we are talking about today is a very important one. As islands, we are surrounded by the sea, so anything that has to do with the sea concerns islands. The Gozo Business Chamber, as its name suggests, is based in Gozo, which is the second largest island in the Maltese archipelago. However, ours is not the main island, and the maritime links are presently the only link that the island has. As the title of the presentation suggests, I will be taking this topic from a chamber, an insular chamber's perspective. As aptly quoted in the synopsis of this webinar, and also as Professor Serafin Poulos rightly pointed out, maritime spatial planning is defined by the directive in establishing a framework for maritime spatial planning, which is the directive that the European uh, commission that the European Union has issued as a process by which the relevant member states authorities analyze and organize human activities in marine areas to achieve ecological, economic and social objectives. As a chamber, we had the opportunity to provide input on this subject in relation to the island of Gozo via written submission, as well as a workshop as part of an Espen Hermes project which had as its primary objective to discuss molten gozo urban maritime scenario development. More precisely, it had to analyze the urban maritime interfaces and cluster development potentials in the stakeholder regions of which Malta and Gozo formed part, define regional specific maritime, urban maritime spatial planning scenarios involving triple helix actors policy actors and city port authorities, provide policy recommendations for the elaboration of strategies for urban maritime regions and contribute to the production of an atlas roadmap on future polycentric urban maritime port regions in Europe. I would first like to outline the scenario of the island of Gozo. Therefore, I am presenting some figures which can help you better visualize uh, the context. Gozo has a population of 33,000 33, people, approximately, which is equivalent to 6.7% of the whole population in the Maltese Islands. Gozo's contribution to the national gross domestic product at market prices was estimated in 2019 to amount to 4.4% of the national total, around 586.2 million euro. In this context, tourism is one of the main contributors to gross domestic product with 50% of, of the GDP. Not taking into consideration the figures for 2020 because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and the effect that it had on Gozo, similarly to other islands in the European Union, I'll be taking uh, the figures for 2019, where Gozo had around 215,000 domestic tourists, because domestic tourism is one of the main economic niches for Gozo and tourism, that is residents on the main island of Malta, which come in Gozo to spend one day or more, while inbound foreign tourists to Gozo amounted to around 180,000. And here it's interesting, according to a survey by the Malta Tourism Authority, it emerged that the main motivations for those foreign tourists spending their holiday in Gozo related mainly to sun, sea and leisure. However, the most important figure of all, and that goes to show the importance of our maritime link, is the fact that Gozo had a significant amount of those who came here to visit Gozo or, or only for a day. And in 2019, the number of foreign tourists to Malta who came to Gozo just for a day was one, around 1,527,000. All of these use the present ferry service which links Gozo to Malta. 
So you can imagine that the route between Gozo and Malta is a very busy one. Because of its, as I said, the COVID-19 pandemic and its abnormal fluctuations, I will be taking again as a base 2019 and not 2020, as it is more of a typical year. And in 2019, as rightly showed in this slide, there were more than 1,700,000 vehicles and nearly 6 million passengers who crossed between Gozo and Malta using the only service available. So that is a picture of our only harbor in Gozo, Dimjar Harbor. Putting this into context is very important, and it goes to show how much maritime transport and also maritime related activities are important for Gozo, considering also that the island of Gozo does not have an airlink for passengers. Apart from a helicopter service, which links the hospital on the main island of Malta to the hospital in Gozo. Going back to the exercise of maritime spatial planning, which I referred to earlier, to which the chamber participated, the analysis that was required was based on four global trends, that is trends which do not apply only to us, but these are global trends, which mainly consisted of the optimization of port operations, port regionalization and multimodality, innovation and digitalization, and the enhancement of sustainability. In the case of Gozo, the main issue that was identified related to port regionalization and multimodality. This was mainly due to the fact that as you can assess and evaluate also from the picture in this slide, Gozo only has one port facility in Njar, which is essential for our island. And this is so essential because of its double insularity, because then we depend on the main island of Malta to access in the international locations. The issues related to the single access point are varied, but principally they relate to the congestion of activities in the port, as you can see from that picture, and they exceed the current port capacities. We have too many activities taking place in the same port, ferry services, yacht marina, fishing vessels, boats carrying tourists to and from the nearby small island of Comino, which is both visible there, and which in normal times is a mecca of tourism activity. Consequently, while we as a chamber, we are in favor of having more modes of transport, and in this regard, there was a very positive development that the government liberalized the market for the fast ferry service operations between the port of Njar in Gozo and the Grand Harbor in Valletta, and two operators already announced that they will start offering this service as from the 1st of June, it would be a gargantuan task, given the congestion already present in the port. However, this is a positive development. So the port facilities need to be expanded in the long term in order to cater for this increased activity. Another problem which we identified in this exercise related to the access to the port facilities. Access to the port is presently through one road. If something happens on this road, like, for example, an accident, access to the sport facility is completely blocked. So we cannot foster entrepreneurship on islands if we underestimate certain planning issues. I have shown that Gozo is presently dependent on its port and maritime links. So while there has been positive developments, other considerations need to be put into place mainly adequate port facilities and accessibility, and both will ensure a seamless provision of all services. Nonetheless, as I said earlier, multimodality of services is important, and having a fast ferry between the two islands will open new economic niches, for example, on incoming cruise liner market who anchor on, in the Grand Harbor of Valletta and then can come to Gozo for a day. Having more services is essential. As the chamber we pointed out also to the need for a cargo service, which would go straight to the Grand Harbor in Valletta from Gozo. The service was already available. However, it had been stopped. This means that many had to face a longer journey to reach their destination, causing an increase in costs and an increase in the pollution generated by cargo traffic. 
As regards accessibility, as a chamber, we have also proposed a sub C tunnel between Gozo and Malta. The government took on the chamber's proposal and a pre-qualification questionnaire was issued and four ventures showed their interest to build and operate the service. The government will now evaluate whether these satisfy the technical criteria and then it will proceed to open the relevant discussions. In these last years, a number of geological and socioeconomic studies have already been conducted by the government. What I wish to point out in this presentation is that maritime spatial planning is important. However, this must be seen within the context of what we want to achieve. When many years ago, ferry services between Gozo and Malta started to be offered during the night, many did not think that there will be enough demand to sustain these services. Not only was it sustained, but services increased, and the government also added another ferry in 2019 to operate between the islands. As an island and as a chamber, we are looking forward to new areas, especially in those areas related to sustainable blue economy issues. issues. We believe that in the case of Gozo, there are potential areas of growth. And in this case, there are a lot of opportunities linked to the blue economy in areas such as renewable energies and research, which can help the economy to diversify further. To this end, it is important to see what we want to achieve and develop our maritime spatial plan accordingly. Thank you very much for, for, for giving us the opportunity. And if you have any questions, I will be happy to take them on later. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Borg. I note also that uh, your uh, words that MSP uh, should be tailor-made, let's say, that is adapted to your specific uh, situation and your specific needs. Um, I would like, uh, because I'm aware of time, of course, and we have a delay of 10 minutes already, I would like to give the floor to my colleague, my peer, of the North Sea, the MSP focal point uh, of the European MSP platform, uh, Mrs. Patricia Annett. Patricia, the floor is yours. Yes. Thank you, Stella. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Thank you. Uh, You're welcome. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, and first of all, thank you for the invitation on behalf of the European MSP platform. And it will be my absolute pleasure to share today some experiences from the North Europe uh, ongo and ongoing developments over there. First about us, uh, but Stella, um, I had the presentation. If you could put it on the screen, would it be possible? Uh, will you, pro uh, you can use, you can use the share and you can uh, project, uh, you can share your presentation by your own. Um, just give me a second. Voila. I thought this was a second uh, chance if there was a technical problem. Yes, hi. Can you see the share button? Uh, yeah, that's what I do. Fine, this is fine. Thank you, Patricia. All right. Uh, can you see it? That's the full screen? Yeah, yeah. Great. Uh, all right. Uh, so, I will start about the platform, uh, which is the assistant mechanism in the EU that supports both the member states and the European Commission. Uh, ah, this will be. Now it's okay. Okay. Uh, Don't touch. <laughs> voila. So you have few slides about you have few sentences about the platform, uh, which is the mechanism of the Commission that aims to support both the member states and the European Commission in the implementation of the UMSP directive. 
And since it's launched, the platform has made a close dialogue with member states regarding the support required for the preparation of the MSPs. And based on the requests received from countries, we have undertaken a number of um, uh, studies and prepared handbooks, such as the MSP communication for effective multi-stakeholder engagement. We also run uh, uh, the workshops, such as there will be in May, the multi-use in the Mediterranean, joint event with the MSP Met, and towards an Atlantic vision for MSP, jointly with Sim Atlantic. Both events uh, in May, and you can find more information on our website. Now, in Northern Europe, we have plenty of islands of various sizes and characteristics. Uh, a few examples you can see in a slide. Um, such as sandy lowland islands of the North Sea, the Warden Islands with muddy intertidal areas. We also have the cliffy and rocky islands, for example, in the Baltic Sea Basin, a vast archipelago of islands, of small islands along the coastline of Sweden and Finland. And there's, of course, uh, islands and other islands. The sizes vary from very small, as mentioned, archipelago to bigger ones. Uh, Scotland, Orland, Bornholm, the islands are often designated as small protected areas with natural 2000, uh, given their biodiversity value and vulnerability to changing conditions and pollution. In terms of the socioeconomic function, they have been traditionally fishing activities on islands, and today it's also largely tourism, given our appreciation of the attractiveness of the islands, of course, and their pristine environment. Uh, bigger islands have plenty of hotels and tourist related facilities, and smaller islands, such as Archipelago Islands, Servers uh, island hopping with a well developed system of ferry services for uh, tourists across the entire region connecting well the islands. Also, today, in a view of the Paris Agreement and the EU offshore renewable energy strategy from last November, uh, that communicates plans for increase in offshore wind capacity, governments increase the offshore renewable energy ambitions, and the islands are increasingly seen in Northern Europe as the outpost for offshore renewable energy. Um, the Northern Europe contained the highest concentration of offshore wind farms in the European Union, and given a long-standing energy priority, the member states from the North Sea Basin established the North Sea Political Cooperation, aimed at facilitating the cost-effective deployment of offshore renewable energy and promoting interconnection between the countries in the North Sea region. Uh, so, as you can see, zero carbon goals still the developments and large-scale activities. It also leads to the development such as the artificial islands in the North Sea. Um, voilà. um, you most likely came across these headlines in the newspapers, since the topic of artificial islands brings always attention. Last year, the Danish parliament passed the new Climate Act, and two artificial islands in the North Sea and Baltic Sea will be developed. In the Netherlands, the a Dutch energy network developed plans to build artificial energy islands with one built power grid hub in the shallow area of Dogger Bank in the middle of the North Sea, what you can see in the right hand corner, from where it would send electricity over a long distance cable to a number of the North Sea countries. Um, the artificial islands uh, are also to give more space by proclaiming a land reclamation and to protect the coastline. And the Dutch are the well, they've been doing it for the centuries, the famous polders. And at the bottom of the slide, you can see a red spot in a map of the Netherlands. That's the Flevo Poland, that is the largest island formed by reclaimed land in the world. Denmark plans to develop nine new islands south of Copenhagen to provide new land. And uh, in the Netherlands, the talks of the developing of artificial islands along the vulnerable coastline uh, are ongoing, where islands will provide coastal protection for the mainland in a view of the climate change. Uh, now, I will present two case studies from the North Sea and from the, from the Baltic Sea. And so you can see that the bases are rather shallow, especially the North Sea uh, at, the, at the level of where are the member states located, EU member states. And there are also this, uh, they are small and with plenty of activities, therefore multi-use uh, and uh, as very common uh, in terms of energy. So the platforms and the food security and tourism and nature protection. Now, um, you, I will go directly to the case from the Netherlands in the same time. Uh, here you can see the Warden Sea, uh, islands that form the archipelago in the North Sea, and they stretch from the Netherlands uh, through Germany to the west of Denmark. 
being the largest unbroken system of intertidal sand and mudflats in the world. It is a large flat coastal wetland environment, home to many plants and animal species, um, and it considered as one of the most important migratory birds in the world. And tourism plays an important role also on these islands. Uh, to maintain critical ecological processes and to protect key features and values, the whole area of Woden Island is currently under international agreement protection practice and the Woden Sea is inscribed as UNESCO's uh, World Heritage List. Now, the trilateral Woden Sea cooperation provides the overall framework and structure for integrated conservation and management of the Woden area as a whole and coordination between all three countries, the Netherlands, Germany and Denmark. Um, this effective management needs to ensure the Nicole system approach to integrate the management of the existing protected areas with other key activities occurring in the area, including tourism, fisheries and shipping. Comprehensive protection measures are in place uh, within each single country and I will zoom now into the management of the water scene from the, how it's being done in the Netherlands. Uh, you can see in a slide uh, three documents and uh, well let me start from the the first one it's at the regional level so the netherlands developed the agenda for the warden region 2050 that describes the joint long-term perspective and goals for the warden region up to 2050 principles of actions and steps towards the implementation program. It was developed by the central government uh, in collaboration with the provinces, municipalities, water boards, nature organizations and the business community from the area of the Warden Sea. And it offers a joint guiding and integrated perspective on the development of the Warden region and establishes the connection between the various areas in the Warden Sea. As you can see in the picture in the slide, uh, there are four areas. It's the Warden Sea, the Warden Islands, coastline uh, on the mainland and the estuary. And this integrated vision of these four elements is an important part of an approach for management of the islands uh, uh, from the perspective of the Netherlands. In a bigger national picture, the wooden agenda uh, links with the objectives from the National Environmental Act and the national management plans are part of the national water program that includes the North Sea program 22-27, you can see it on the left uh, hand side together with the Dutch MSP plan that is included in it. Another important national document for MSP is the North Sea Agreement that contains detailed actions for the implementation of ecology, offshore energy and possibilities for the fishery sectors to adapt. Looking at the plans from the north of the Dutch Warden Islands, um, they have been designated one, uh, wind energy at sea and currently the offshore wind park in the area of the north of the Warden Island is under construction. And there is potentially room for 10 gigabyte uh, north of the Warden Island, so developments are expected in the longer run. And as mentioned earlier, the Warden Island municipalities collaborated in the development of this agenda for the Warden region 2050. And I will mention now briefly about the sustainable ambition and uh, actions of the biggest of them in the Dutch water, which is the Tex uh, Tessel Island. Uh, you can see it in the map, in, in the picture, there are very vast dunes on the island and the island itself is about 160 km square kilometer, contains seven villages with roughly 14,000 inhabitants, main industries are tourism, agriculture and fisheries. Uh, the island has a ferry connection and receives about 2 million tourists each year. Uh, the Island Council developed an energy vision for the island and the implementation plan working closely with residents and organizations on the island. Uh, what is important is that TESEL aims at being self-sufficient in renewable energy by 2030 and there are stimulated energy innovations on the island, uh, for example, using renewable and smart technologies, mobilizing the whole community to take part in the clean in energy transition. Overall, also among the other islands is an intensive cooperation, including elements of test, blueprint, uh, print, smart energy pilots, sustainable tourist businesses and renewable energy location planning with smart island grids, local renewable energy mix. And there are many, many ongoing developments. And that also comes from the number of projects that the island participated in. These were the pilot projects in the field of renewable energy, which helped to develop the vision, the energy vision for the island. And TESEL also participates in the EU initiative Clean Energy for EU Islands initiative that will be the next presentation. Now, we will travel now to Finland. So we are going north uh, to the Baltic Sea. And uh, the 
we are going to the archipelago sea islands and island islands in Finland consisting of thousands of small and bigger islands. They are located within Finnish territorial waters between Finland and the mainland and Sweden. And by some definition, it is the largest archipelago in the world by the number of the islands. Although many of these islands are very small and tightly clustered, uh, Finland has over 80,000 islands. In total, most of which are located in the archipelago. See so exactly that is designated the UNESCO Biosphere Reserve. The island islands um, in the west form an autonomous region within, within Finland. The larger islands are inhabited and connected by ferries and uh, bridges. The number of permanent residents on the islands is about 60,000, inhabiting about 60 islands. Um, the archipelago is a significant tourist destination and the significance of tourists to the economy of the island is constantly increasing. Also fishing is important and for this vast area of Finland, including the islands, was developed the Maritime Special Plan 2030 that consists of three maritime special plans in three planning areas, including exactly the archipelago sea and southern Botanian sea with the discussed island. Uh, here in the slide, you can see the picture of the MSP plan 2030 from the area of the Archipelago Sea. This area is one of the three planning areas of the Finland's MSP 2030, and it specifically addresses the islands of the Archipelago and the Inuits. Finland decided to divide the MSP into three areas due to geographic characteristics of the areas. And as such, in the plan of the Archipelago Sea, the most important factor that influences the structure and composition of better com communities are exactly the archipelago islands, and uh, these conditions are taken into account. Uh, the archipelago sea is divided into the inner, middle, and outer archipelago, and they differ in the landscape, vegetation, and fauna. And this variety is grasped in the MSP of the archipelago in the Finnish MSP plan. Uh, furthermore, as you can see in the map, the MSP plan for the archipelago sea includes both the islands of the archipelago and the coastal areas of the mainland. Uh, as such, the MSP plan integrates three parts. Uh, these are the coastal areas of the mainland, the islands, and the sea. In general, Finland, in developing its national MSP, also for other parts of the coast, uh, took the approach of preparing it from the coastline towards the offshore marine areas. So the land-sea interactions are an integral part of the plan, and this approach allowed for practical way of integration of coastal and marine areas together with the islands. Um, the MSP was developed by the Coastal Regional Councils together with the Ministry of the Environment, uh, marine stakeholders and experts. It was done in a collaborative process with a vision for coastal marine management up to 2030 built by stakeholders. In this collaborative process, uh, there was intensive future scenario work that I would like to highlight. Uh, it involved hundreds of stakeholders who discussed possible future conditions. The Island Islands, you can see it on the left side of the slide, uh, they develop their own MSP because they are autonomous. And this MSP encompasses uh, marine and coastal areas. So similar as Finnish plan, uh, it provides, the MSP provides the integrated coastal and marine vision for planning and management, which is an essential element of all islands uh, MSP. Uh, there are plenty of other islands in the region, uh, including the bordering Stockholm archipelago. Sweden has thousands of islands in the archipelago along its mainland. And the transboundary collaboration uh, among the islands in the Baltic is supported by EU-funded projects. And there is, for example, a dedicated interreg project program for Central uh, Baltic with an archipelago and island sub-program covering the islands that you can see in the picture at the bottom of the slide. Uh, so there is involved uh, Sweden, Finland, Estonia uh, with, the island, uh, with the islands in the program. Uh, as part, that is my almost last slide, as part of the Finland's uh, vision work energy sector 2030, the country promotes the transition uh, to a low carbon by increasing offshore wind production. Uh, the overall objective is to produce energy cost effectively in marine areas, taking sustainable development and safety into account. Here I would like to give an example of the island island, islands that to ensure energy supply for the islands in the long term and to provide uh, the opportunity to sell its wind generated power on the regional market. They are constructing a 160 subsea transmission cable to connect the islands with mainland Finland. 
That's also because uh, currently Ireland gets mostly uh, the islands gets mostly electricity from Sweden. This new cable contributing to the increase of renewable energy production in the region will also enhance the possibility to close uh, fossil fuel reserve power units uh, on the islands. And this new transmission cable will also be used as a route between the Swedish and uh, Finnish energy markets, uh, therefore to help to stabilize the Nordic electricity market. Energy efficiency and area decarbonization uh, are important elements in the Finnish islands thinking and consideration as such that are developed towards the hydrogen ferries in the region. As you can see in the picture on the left hand side, uh, there is a well developed system of ferry services across the entire region connecting well the islands of the Finnish archipelago sea, the island islands and the Swedish archipelago. That serves for the popular island hopping, uh, but maritime transport accounts for the majority of islands emissions. Therefore, green hydrogen is considered a, a potential energy carrier to provide a renewable alternative to fossil fuel use in the ferry traffic. Uh, there are ongoing projects, for instance, the feasibility study project on green energy production at the wind farm and use in ferries in the islands has been finished that demonstrates 100% renewable energy system in the island islands and the project realization is expected in the, three, in the coming three years. Um, the final aspect that I would like to draw to your attention to is uh, in terms of regional developments uh, is estimating and allocating the battery energy storage systems in the island islands for large scale integration of renewables and electric ferry charging stations for the future developments. Uh, for this, please refer to on the map to, to the right hand side picture where you can see the green islands. It shows the geographical location of the grid structure on the islands with power transmission line supplies from uh, Sweden and from Finland. And in the interest of time, I will not go into details, uh, but to mention that island harbor grids are shifting towards renewable energy sources to cope with the growing demand for an offshore power and supply and battery charging stations for mother ships. And mother systems are rapidly changing uh, with the increased renewable energy sources and transportation electrification on islands and the marine sector on the islands with anticipated increased installation of renewable energy sources and battery energy storage system at ships and harbors in the region. And I will Could stop here. Uh, I would Could like to thank you very me? much and also to briefly summarize that uh, what I showed is that integrated and holistic approach in MSP to islands planning and management is crucial, including coastal planning together with maritime planning as shown in these two examples from the north. Uh, international collaboration, transboundary cooperation are critical at the regional scale for sustainable management of islands. Even if there is no official international collaboration, it can be done through projects and initiatives on a sea basin scale and constraining environmental pollution, climate mitigation with innovative solutions on islands through energy efficiency and decarbonization are on high rise and importance in the north. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Patricia. Um, I have very much liked your uh, uh, rich, uh, really rich uh, presentation uh, of this large spectrum of uh, best practices uh, in the islands, uh, in the North Sea, in the Baltic Sea. Uh, the example of Finland. Um, I wish, I wish really, and I, I, I suggest if you like. Uh, uh, this is this was like something like a compendium of best practices, and uh, I would I would suggest uh, Insular to and the Center of Excellence perhaps uh, to to undertake uh, such a study, perhaps from a comparative perspective. That is to 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 see uh, cases also case studies in the Mediterranean uh, in south north south. A north-south comparative perspective. Uh, this would be uh, really interesting and, and useful, I think, uh, for implementing uh, MSP uh, in the islands. Uh, thank you very much again. And uh, now uh, I will give the floor uh, to Mr. Jan Kornigi, uh, who is the project leader for the Clean Energy for the EU Islands Initiative. Uh, clean energy for EU islands from island vision to energy action. Dear Jan, sorry for the delay. The floor is yours. Thank you. And um, in the meantime, I shared my screen. I hope you see it. 
Yes, do you uh, see my screen? Good. Yes, uh, of course. Okay, okay. Yeah, uh, okay. <laughs> I just wanted to be sure. Thank you very much Perfect. and good afternoon. And uh, thank you um, and allow me to uh, make some some uh, uh, yeah, closing remarks. Uh, I, I won't have as much detail uh, as in the previous pre presentation, which was very interesting uh, on the marine spatial planning and with excellent examples uh, and also some of the projects we are working on. Now, I would like to start by um, sort of going back uh, uh, in memory lane for myself uh, almost 10 years ago i was uh, i became the chief of uh, cabinet of the uh, belgian vice prime minister and minister of the north sea he also had competences for economics and all and so forth but he was minister of the north sea and uh, there we uh, initiated actually the first marine spatial plan um for belgium the, the Belgian North Sea, uh, which is a small but very crowded uh, uh, piece of the North Sea. Um, and we were actually even before uh, the European Directive uh, and the obligation uh, that was uh, um, set uh, to come up with a marine spatial plan by this year. Actually, uh, uh, we by the time the Directive was out, we had already made uh, our marine uh, spatial plan. And so it was interesting for us to see how it evolved. Now, what I linking it to the clean energy for eu island initiative uh i can now say looking back on the last 10 years um we developed one uh, um zone uh, for offshore wind uh, of around 2.2 uh, gigawatts uh, and if we had not uh, engaged in this spatial planning uh, this process of participation this process of stakeholder uh, questioning all the different activities trying to plan them together we would not have been able to secure a second zone of again two around two gigawatt uh, in the north sea and and that will now uh, in the next um uh, years uh, uh, that new zone will be constructed uh, uh, as well and so just to point out that marine social uh, planning um uh, marine spatial planning sorry uh, together uh, with uh, clean energy is a very important uh, combination and it's a very important uh, link there to be able to plan ahead in the future. I mean, those projects like offshore wind, they are very, um, they have long lead times, they're very capital intensive, uh, uh, and it's important uh, that there is uh, um, uh, acceptance uh, by all the stakeholders from the islands, from the mainland, from all the economic actors uh, to engage in that. So I, I wanted to point uh, that out to start with. I'll go quickly through the presentation. I don't have many slides and and I, uh, I don't want to dwell on, 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 on many of those things, but as a clean energy for EU islands, this is also one of the priorities. So we are now in the second phase of the clean energy for EU island secretariat, just started now, I mean, like last uh, month. Um, and uh, we are building on a political declaration on the clean energy for EU islands, which was signed in Valletta, Malta. And, and so the colleague of Gozo, uh, you know, Valletta was at the basis of, of, of our work. What uh, are we aiming for? We are aiming to reach uh, EU islands communities, uh, um, pledging uh, to the clean energy for EU island uh, pledge, uh, the transition agenda. So in order to make sure that on more islands, uh, uh, we are uh, starting in that work. And, and that work is very much similar to marine spatial planning. It's also about, about uh, stakeholder consultation. It's about aligning all the interests uh, of um, the islanders, but also uh, the tourists uh, that come on the islands and so forth. Uh, very importantly, and, and that's going to be the, my main topic, uh, is the technical assistance uh, to 40 island communities. And we're also looking uh, at policy and regulatory barriers, uh, which will um, uh, be an important part of the, uh, the Secretariat. Um, what is very important for us is we work with the islands in whatever phase of clean energy transition they are. If they just start exploring the theme, we can help them if they start shaping projects uh, and, and concrete plans and action plans. We can help them move that forward, um, attract financing and, and try to create bankable projects. Uh, and we, uh, if they are already acting and, and have come up uh, with concrete projects, we can help implementation. Uh, and so wherever the islands are, and some are very advanced, some are just uh, discovering the topic, we can uh, assist and we have uh, regional partners uh, in Spain, Croatia, Italy, Greece, uh, Portugal, Denmark, and so forth. Uh, 
with uh, those regional partners, with the Secretariat, we work on the islands uh, with the local uh, uh, communities, authorities, uh, energy communities on transition. Now, the asset, the technical assistance is very important for us, and that's also where the topic is between marine spatial planning and um, the um, uh, the clean energy transition. Because if we look at the different options there are, obviously offshore wind is a big one, but offshore wind uh, is also a contested one. We, we, you know, we have to be upfront about this. Um, it's important if uh, zones are dedicated for offshore wind that it is done in a way uh, with uh, respect uh, to landscape co considerations, uh, maritime considerations, um, uh, ecological uh, habitat considerations, and so forth. And so we we are not saying let's put offshore wind everywhere. Uh, we're uh, saying let's. Uh, you know, take into account all these factors and by uh, doing planning, look at exactly uh, how uh, this um, uh, offshore wind can be done. Same thing, for instance, for floating PV, uh, which is not yet a very competitive uh, um, uh, technology, but floating PV on seas, especially calmer seas, uh, is something that is being explored and could in the future uh, be of interest. Same for wave energy, uh, either for electricity or for desalination. Uh, I mean, those are technologies uh, that have an impact uh, on uh, the clean energy side, but also have an impact ecologically poten uh, potentially. And so uh, one has to plan for this and one has to look at, at how, um, where these technologies actually are, are uh, you know, performing best, but also are best integrated uh, in uh, the, the, um, the spatial planning uh, that is foreseen. Uh, pipelines, especially also the hydro hydrogen backbone. Uh, I, the previous speaker already referred to it, and and I know that in Holland uh, we are in contact with the people who are thinking about hydrogen. And uh, you know there might be also think there might might also be thoughts about pipelines and so forth. This is obviously also uh, an issue that is important. Now, when we uh, think of technical assistance, uh, um, we will. Uh, oh, that uh, I think yes. Uh, yeah, um, when we think of technical assistance, I mean, we can look at all those areas uh, and uh, from the regulatory side, we will take in the considerations also for the marine uh, spatial planning. Now, um, we want to get to projects uh, and therefore we have a call for technical assistance right now, uh, which is open. Uh, uh, people can submit uh, an, an engagement uh, before the 5th of May. Now, what is important there is we strive for impact. And if you look at impact, um, in terms of carbon uh, emissions, well, the highest impact is the transport uh, and it's electrification or hydrogen transport uh, to and from the islands because that's the most CO2. The second highest impact is obviously coal-fired or uh, petrol-fired power stations, uh, which are uh, emitting a lot of CO2. And, and so if we can, with renewable energy, uh, create an alternative uh, to uh, those uh, power stations and uh, creating flexibility, demand response, all these uh, elements that make it possible, we are uh, very happy to look into it. And obviously, we're also then looking to uh, the activities on the island and how we can uh, sustain, uh, how can we can support sustainable activities uh, on the island with clean energy. Uh, and uh, for, from that perspective, the islands are actually um, pioneering in Europe and they can, uh, you know, because of their uh, remoteness and, and uh, uh, isolation, they are actually interesting to engage in some of the uh, activities uh, and do some pilots on, uh, for instance, uh, the way that renewable assets can uh, feed into the grid and uh, two batteries, vehicle to grid, uh, marine vessels to grid. I mean, all these things uh, are important uh, to look at uh, and, and, and for those things, the islands can be um, uh, a very important and very potent player uh, in Europe. So uh, that's uh, actually all I wanted to say. We are looking forward to uh, working uh, with many of the partners also from the uh, marine spatial uh, world. Um, and uh, obviously coming from the clean energy uh, angle, uh, we think there's a lot of opportunities. We think there's also uh, sufficient space if it is planned well. And with that, I would like to uh, end my presentation. Thank you very much for uh, your uh, attention.
Thank you very much, uh, Jan, for your uh, for respecting the time first of all, <laughs> and for this uh, very interesting presentation uh, that uh, gave us a lot of opportunities, as you said. Uh, um, we have to think about and uh, um, perhaps uh, in the Q and A session uh, you will. Uh, uh, be asked uh, to 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 respond to several questions. Uh, we have uh, two requests uh, from uh, Miss Seleni Hadzigiani from the Digimare and from the Vice Governor of Crete, uh, uh, Mr. George Alexakis. But I think uh, this is uh, up to uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Asonitis, Dr. Asonitis, uh, to go on with this uh, intervention and Q and A session. So uh, I um, give uh, now the uh, the moderation to to George. No, thank you. Yes. Uh, okay. Yes. No. No. Not, not, don't give it to me. But anyway, you have uh, five minutes. Uh, we can go till uh, five past four. Past five. Okay. So uh, we give the floor to Eleni. Yes. Okay. Please, uh, Lady, Mrs. Hadziani. Yes, uh, hello, uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Because, uh, yes, yes. Okay, because I didn't know if I had the control to, to unmute myself. So, uh, good afternoon and uh, congratulations for the organization of this very interesting uh, webinar. Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm uh, Eleni. Uh, I'm Eleni Katsigiani from uh, Digimare. I'm a policy officer uh, at Digimare at uh, the uh, unit on uh, uh, maritime regional cooperation, sea basin strategies, and uh, maritime security. Uh, I'm a marine scientist uh, focusing on my postdoc research on marine spatial planning and integrated coastal zone management. And uh, together, we join together from Digimare today from, with my colleague uh, Manuel. So we would like to, 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 to raise your attention on another perspective apart from the legislation so far mentioned and the administrative procedure and the obligation of the member states to, to submit their plans as there have been already a lot uh, said before regarding that. So uh, please allow me to, 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 to uh, raise your attention uh, for uh, one or two minutes regarding the sea basin and the macro regional perspective. And this is because of the need for the cooperation in the marine environment we all share as uh, countries and uh, as uh, regions in, in the different sea basins. Uh, for that, uh, I will give uh, you an example for the Mediterranean. Uh, in terms of the Mediterranean Sea Basin, already uh, the uh, existing initiatives have very well uh, stressed uh, the importance of uh, this uh, tool of uh, uh, maritime spatial planning as a tool in order to achieve the sustainability and in the coexistence of the different marine sectors as the marine spatial planning is the tool of the strong uh, ecosystemic approach uh, uh, for the coexistence of the different activities in the coastal and the, and the uh, uh, marine uh, environment. Uh, first of all, to, to, to remind to everybody that uh, very recently, uh, the Union for Mediterranean uh, Ministerial Declaration adopted by the ministers of the UFM countries has very clearly uh, dedicated a specific paragraph on the maritime spatial planning and the integrated coastal zone management. So uh, the political messages from the UFM ministers are very strong, uh, apart from the other uh, uh, priorities for the blue economy sectors, to cooperate in the Mediterranean for the maritime spatial planning as well. And this is of uh, very significance because uh, uh, there is also another uh, communication very recently published. There is the new agenda for the Mediterranean, uh, which uh, endorses uh, all the uh, uh, priorities which are also relevant, not only for the European countries in the Mediterranean, but also for the uh, south and shore of the Mediterranean. And we all very clearly understand how important it is as the Mediterranean is a close basin, we need to share all the countries together in order to achieve uh, uh, in the maximum level the sustainability for the blue economy sectors. 
another very important component in terms of the cooperation in this uh, sea basin is, of course, the very well known to everybody uh, WestMed initiative. Uh, through uh, their goal, uh, goals, um, there's a specific um, uh, um, uh, priority to, to, to the sustainability in the, in the blue economy sectors. And also, uh, going uh, to a macro regional perspective, please allow me to highlight uh, in the Mediterranean Sea the European strategy of Adriatic Ionian macro region, and I will explain why. Uh, first of all, because maritime special planning is a cross sectoral approach in the pillars of the European strategy of uh, Adriatic Ionian macro region. And in terms of the flagships, uh, they've been adopted by the governing board of the USER. Uh, the implementation of the um, uh, MSP and also in accordance to the implementation uh, and the priorities of the Barcelona Convention is one of the flagships of the Pillar 3 on uh, environmental quality. So this is to remind to all of us that in, uh, in a sea basin perspective, but also in a closer dimension geographically, such as the uh, macro regional perspective, it is very important for the member states and the, in, on the national level, but also on the regional level to cooperate all together for activities we have to establish in this common marine environment uh, to, to work together and to stress our efforts uh, in order to achieve the maximum outputs in terms of uh, sustainability in the blue economy sectors. And last but uh, not least, to, to to uh, share with you that um, uh, uh, Digimare is working uh, the last month on a new communication on the, on the sustainable blue economy, which is going to be published uh, um, in the next months. Many, many organizations uh, from different countries have uh, significantly contributed to the consultation, which uh, ended uh, last year. So we are looking forward to this as um, an overarching initiative to all together together with other dimensions of the sea basins of the macro regional uh, around Europe to, to contribute together uh, with the stakeholders to the uh, sustainable dimension of the blue economy on, on uh, an umbrella and on, on an on a, uh, overarching perspective on a European level. So thank you very much for your time, congratulations, and um, please feel free to ask any we can, uh, me and my colleague, uh, contribute uh, to your discussion. Thanks a lot. Κυρία Κιβέλου, πρέπει να ανοίξετε το μικρόφωνο σας. I'm new. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, all, my, all, all the thanks go to you, uh, Mrs. Hadzigiani, for this uh, very important intervention and all the points raised uh, that are really helpful and um, informative and constructive because uh, you know the many countries that are uh, actually uh, in the process of elaborating their plans yet uh, Greece for example is now uh, beginning uh, with uh, the, the strategy for the marine space so all this uh, information is is really useful um, countries should establish uh, links, uh, really, with all these initiatives, on my opinion. And, um, uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Alexakis? Um... Hello? Could you yes. hear me? Yes, yes we can hear you. Congratulations for this very interesting seminar especially to Professor Poulos for his comprehensive and useful speech. And of course to you, Professor Kivelu, the famous lady, lady of European Regional Development Forum around the Europe. Thanks for the invitation to friends, Asonitis and Keta Yoglu. Greetings to Gianni Gianetta, Eleni Gianni, and all the friends uh, of uh, Ireland. Uh, as the president mentioned yesterday, we had the General Assembly of CPMR Island uh, Committee, 
and we decide to emphasize about the need uh, of more aid, more help for islands on the context of the new uh, funds, the recovery and uh, resilience fund and uh, the just transition fund in order to face the crisis on islands, the pandemic crisis. I would like uh, to emphasize on three points. The first one is that there is a great need for cooperation and solidarity for all the bodies related with MSP, especially in Greece. I mean uh, the stakeholders. I mean the academia, the researchers, professors, regions, politicians, planners, ecologists, economists, all the stakeholders, all the people that can understand what is MSP, why we need MSP, in order to boost it. The second point is that uh, I want to stress, uh, stress out the role of region in this procedure especially the maritime regions, the islands in these procedures that may ha must have a key role on MSP, uh, among other stakeholders. And the third point is, if we follow this methodology, then we could propose points of change, points of optimize the Greek law of MSP. That's three uh, clear uh, and short points I would like to contribute in this discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, George Alexakis. Uh, always, uh, I think that CPMR is missing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, but in the next webinar, I would just like to, to remind you that on the 10th of May, the MSP platform, together with the MSP uh, MED project, organizes a, an important webinar on the multi-use uh, of in the marine space. Uh, this is, on my opinion, very, very important uh, for the islands also. Uh, 10th of May, save the date. <laughs> yes, please. Okay, save the date and uh, we'll um, keep you informed. Um, so we are um, please close the conference. George. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Stella. Thank you all for well, your participation. George does not respond, perhaps. Uh, no, no, I'm uh, here. As I see in the, in the chat. I'm here, Stella. I'm here, Stella. I'm, uh, thank I you, everybody. In the chat. Kyriaki, welcome. I'll let you know what I'm going to do. Ah, okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you all no for problem. your No problem. No, no, no. I'm hearing. Thank you Here. all for your participation. Uh, just uh, to note that uh, CPMR and the Commission of Islands is supporting us. They were contacted to participate. Uh, anyway, they are there with us and we will continue this uh, collaboration. Uh, thank you, everybody. All, all the material will be uploaded and sent to all of you. Thank you. We have to finish now because we start our General Assembly, Insular General Assembly. Thank you again. Next time. See you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us.